two minutes more. Okay. And that's it. Then I went through. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, we are back another week today in the EBD seminars. Today we have uh, Malin. Malin uh, or is originally from from Sweden, uh, where he studied her thesis, uh, her bachelor in uh, in ecology. Sorry. And uh, also in the Stockholm University, he, she studied uh, the thesis in conservation genetics uh, in the Scandinavian Arctic Fox. Now she's working with the group of Godoy, now doing similar stuff, but uh, now working with the Iberian Lynx. So that's all for, for the introduction. For the people in YouTube, we are reading you. So ask questions if you have, and of course you ask many questions after the talk. Uh, so the floor is yours, Mali. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Malin, and uh, I arrived here in November, and uh, this is my first postdoc after finishing my uh, PhD. Uh, and yeah, I'm working uh, on uh, conservation genomics in Iberian lynx uh, with Jose Godoy work that I did during my PhD uh, on conservation genomics in uh, Arctic Fox. And my, uh, the grant that I have is uh, from Sweden, so I have a mobility support, so my home university is at Stockholm University and then my host institute is uh, EBD. Yeah, so uh, this is my uh, PhD thesis that I finished about one year and a half ago. And uh, here I am celebrating that I passed. <laughs> and uh, just a little fun fact, uh, Carles here from EBD, he was the opponent for my defense, so the main person in the committee. Um, and I knew that Carles had been working a lot on uh, inbreeding in wolves before, so I was reading up a lot about that. Um, but he didn't want to discuss wolves. He said, oh, I want to discuss the um, situation of the Iberian lynx. And uh, he put up a big picture of a uh, Iberian lynx here on the screen. Um, and at this point in time, I didn't know so much about the uh, study system of the Iberian lynx. But now as a coincidence, I'm here one and a half year later working on the lynx. So it's exciting. Um, but today I will talk about the uh, Arctic fox, but first uh, a little bit of uh, background information. So everyone here knows that uh, during the last two centuries, a uh, um, large number of species worldwide have uh, gone extinct and an even larger number is uh, threatened by extinction. So for example, um, over 30% of all insect species are now declining. And here's a study from WWF showing that uh, the abundance of over 16,000 populations represented by over 4,000 species have declined by an average of 60% since the 1970s. Um, and as a population becomes uh, sm very small, there are additional uh, threats such as demographic and environmental stochasticity, but uh, genetic factors also become, can become uh, a major problem. So small populations are often subjected to a strong genetic drift and uh, this will at random lead to accumulation and, fix and fixation of uh, harmful mutations and will also lead to uh, loss of genetic variation on a population level. Uh, but small populations are often also exposed to strong uh, levels of inbreeding 
which will lead to uh, loss of genetic variation on an individual level due to uh, the genetic similarity of closely related parents. And together these processes often lead to reduced fitness and evolutionary potential and this is also known as inbreeding depression which can be apparent as uh, lower reproduction and higher mortality. And in turn, this will lead to an even smaller population size, which will be exposed to even stronger levels of inbreeding and genetic drift and will uh, reduce the population even further. And this negative feedback loop is known as the extinction vortex. And the theory suggests that it can uh, even drive a population to extinction. Um, but uh, these uh, effects can be um, reversed by gene flow from uh, unrelated individuals into a small population, which uh, will increase the genetic variation and that can be done through uh, a few different processes, for example by the masking of recessive deleterious alleles uh, or through uh, increasing heterozygosity at uh, loci where a heterozygous genotype has a selective advantage over either of the homozygotes. Um, and gene flow can also introduce a number of beneficial alleles. And uh, together this can lead to a selective advantage in hybrids, which is also known as heterosis. And if uh, this selective advantage also translates into population growth, it's known as genetic rescue. Um, but it's, uh, it's hard to predict the outcome of gene flow and for how long a genetic rescue process generally lasts. So the traditional views has uh, regarded this as a process acting over several generations, but that's not uh, always the case. Um, for example, if the migrants have uh, so higher selective, uh, a lot higher selective advantage compared to the native populations, they can replace the gene pool quite quickly and the effective population size becomes even smaller than before, uh, which can increase inbreeding depression quite quickly again. Uh, and the back crossing with natives can also quite quickly increase inbreeding again. Um, so all of this has interested biologists, uh, biologists for several centuries, um, but uh, it still remains quite challenging to study in the wild. And uh, this is mainly due to uh, the, the difficulties uh, uh, related to the long-term individual monitoring of uh, wild populations. Um, but there are some uh, well-known examples where both inbreeding depression and genetic rescue has been uh, documented in the wild. So for example, in bighorn sheep, uh, uh, the Scandinavian wolf population, Florida panther and mountain pygmy possum are some examples. Um, but there are still many questions that uh, remain unresolved. For example, the underlying mechanism of uh, inbreeding depression has uh, not been studied so much in detail. For example, how many mutations are involved in inbreeding depression and what are the strength of them? For example, is it caused by uh, a few loci of very large effect or is it caused by many slightly del deleterious mutations across the genome. And, uh, um, yeah, and the number and the strength of alleles involved in inbreeding depression could also uh, determine the efficiency of removal of these uh, deleterious mutations from natural, due to natural selection, which is also uh, known as purging. Um, yeah, and so, so with the recent advances of the genomic techniques, there's also become um, an increasing debate lately on what is the best, uh, uh, the best methods to reduce inbreeding depression in the wild. Is it generally to uh, maximize genetic variation or should we more look at uh, reducing the number of uh, deleterious mutations uh, in the population? So it's a quite big debate that's been going on lately. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so now to my study system. So uh, I have been studying some of these processes in the Scandinavian Arctic fox. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So um, worldwide, the Arctic fox is, uh, is not endangered. It has a circumpolar Arctic uh, distribution and it resides in uh, tundra habitats. Um, and it's, uh, it's very well adapted to the cold. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite small. It's uh, about the same size as a domestic cat. It weighs uh, three to five kilos. Um, and it has the thickest fur that, uh, in all the animals. And it even has uh, fur on top of the foot pads. Um, and also compared to the red fox, the ears and the snout is much uh, smaller and shorter. So that's also an adaptation to the cold. Um, and yeah, so globally it's uh, not endangered, but uh, in uh, Scandinavia it is. So once the, the, popula the population used to be very abundant in Scandinavia too, with uh, several thousands of individuals, but uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, it, uh, it went through a major both demogra demographic and genetic bottleneck. And this was due to intensive hunting for fur. So it was uh, very quickly reduced from uh, several thousand of individuals to uh, uh, only a couple of hundred. So in 1927, it was decided that the Arctic fox uh, uh, was going to be protected, protected in Sweden instead. And uh, a year later, Finland and Norway also followed. Um, but despite this, um, Almost 100 years later, the Arctic fox is still endangered in Scandinavia. And we have about 400 individuals in the whole of Scandinavia today. Yeah, OK, so uh, this lack of uh, recovery is, uh, main can mainly be explained by uh, increased competition with the red fox and with uh, uh, irregularity in rodent cycles. So um, together with the, with the global warming, the red fox has been able to emerge higher up on the tundra and it competes with the Arctic fox for both uh, food and territories. And it's, uh, it's almost twice the size of an Arctic fox, so they can even um, kill uh, an adult Arctic fox. And they also bring in disease such as uh, psychoptic mange. And uh, for the rodent cycle, so the Arctic foxes, the main food source uh, is rodents uh, such as lemmings and voles. And these fluctuate uh, naturally and they have uh, these uh, rodent peak years every third to fourth year approximately. And during these years you can see lemmings like all over the mountain, you almost uh, step on them. And then uh, the next year the population crash. And uh, the foxes are adapted to these uh, cycles and they uh, really depend on this uh, increase in peak year. So during these years they have uh, uh, very big litters. They can get up to 18 cubs in one single litter. Uh, and then in these uh, crash years they don't reproduce at all or they get maybe a litter of two cubs. Um, yeah, but since uh, year uh, you can see here during the whole uh, 90s, these uh, peak years, they totally disappeared. And this, of course, affected the foxes uh, negatively as well. And after this, these uh, peaks have come back a little bit. They're not as high as they used to be, uh, but they have returned a bit. Uh, and also since uh, year 2000, a conservation program has been implemented uh, in Scandinavia. And, uh, that includes uh, removal of red foxes from uh, Arctic fox territories and uh, also uh, supplemental feeding. So here you can see a feeding station which is located a couple of hundred meters from an Arctic fox den. And uh, we fill these barrels with uh, dog food and uh, it uh, increases the survival of the Arctic fox, both cubs and uh, adults. And also in Norway, there's um, a captive breeding station that has been established. So they breed the foxes in captivity and then they, they release them at uh, different sites. So uh, um, my study population is uh, 
So, so now the Arctic foxes, they are, um, are very fragmented. So they, um, they now live in many different small subpopulations. And the, the main uh, study population of my thesis is the southernmost uh, subpopulation of Sweden that's located here and is called the Helagsfjellen population. And uh, this population, it went to functionally extinct, more or less, uh, during the 90s. But then it was re-established uh, in 2001 and started to increase again in size and in size. Um, and this was, uh, it was largely thanks to uh, this uh, female Arctic fox that she was named the, the Queen of Helags. And she became at least 10 years old and during her lifetime she had over 60 cubs. So most foxes, they die as cubs, and if they survive the first year, um, they, they usually don't become older than three or four years. So she became really old. So, um, but since it was so much thanks to her that the population was increasing, it was a bit worrying what, uh, what would have happened to do the inbreeding levels. Um, so, um, a pedigree based on microsatellites was uh, constructed and it showed that the population was founded by only seven individuals and it was isolated for 10 years. Uh, and during this time the inbreeding levels of course um, increased quite rapidly. And at the end of the study period, that was in 2008, the inbreeding levels corresponded to those of half-sibling matings. And it was also evident that uh, the population was suffering from inbreeding depression. So during years with uh, low uh, rodent abundance, uh, more inbred individuals had a lower chance to survive their first year of life. Um, but during years with high rodent abundance, um, the more inbred individuals instead had a lower chance of uh, reproducing. But then, uh, suddenly in uh, 2010 and 2011, mm. there was uh, immigration into mm. the population. So uh, the immigrants, there were three male immigrants that uh, immigrated and established and produced litters in the population. And they, uh, were, uh, uh, or they were originating from the captive breeding station and then they had been released in a subpopulation nearby the breeding station, and then they immigrated into Helagsfjellen. And here you can see one of these immigrants caught on a, a remote camera at a den in Helagsfjellen. And the way this was uh, discovered was the fact that they brought in a new color morph into this population. So before the immigration, all of the foxes were of uh, this white color morph. Um, but then in 2010, <coughs> litters with both uh, white and blue cubs started to appear. And uh, so, th so this color morph, it can be used as a natural marker for gene flow. So uh, two white foxes, fo uh, the white morph is inherited by a recessive allele. So two white foxes can only have white cubs but uh, um, a blue fox that, that is heterozygous for blue, uh, together with a white fox, they will have approximately 50-50 white and uh, blue cubs. So yeah, so this was quite uh, neat that we could uh, so easily discover this uh, gene flow. And this, uh, all of this kind of sets the background for my uh, PhD thesis. Um, so the most general aims that uh, I wanted to answer was uh, what are the genetic and the genomic effects of uh, inbreeding and gene flow and also what are the fitness effects of inbreeding and gene flow. Uh, so, uh, so the whole um, reason why I could study this in the wild uh, in this population is that uh, there has been this long term individual uh, uh, data collection. So every summer we, we visit all the known Arctic fox dens 
uh, and we record if there are litters present and we count the number of cubs and uh, we also we catch the cubs in these kind of uh, live traps and when we caught them we weigh and measure them and we ear tag them with these uh, they get the unique color combinations in their ears and by this way we can also recognize the foxes that have survived and reproduced during the following years so we don't have to uh, catch them again. Uh, and from this I could also extract the different fitness measures such as uh, and yeah the ones I've used are juvenile survival, lifespan and different measures of uh, reproductive success. Uh, and when we ear tag uh, the foxes we we get a tiny piece of tissue from the ear punches that we put in ethanol and take back to the lab for genetic analysis. And we don't only study the foxes in the summer, we also uh, study the density of the rodents. And we do that by putting out these uh, snap traps in the transects uh, uh, in, the, in some fixed uh, territories to see the difference between territories but also between years in the rodent abundance. Uh, okay, so uh, to the first uh, study of my thesis. So um, in this study, um, I extended the pedigree that was stretching to 2008. Uh, and so now it's stretched to 2015 instead to see what, the, what is the effect on the population of these uh, immigrants. And uh, we could see that uh, there was a very rapid spread of uh, the ancestry of this uh, three males and I should also say that two of these males were actually brothers and the third one was uh, unrelated uh, and their ancestry spread very rapidly in the population and you can see that this led to uh, also a rapid decrease in uh, inbreeding levels that you can see by the line here so before it corresponded to half sibling matings but in 2015 it corresponded more to cousin matings. Um, and we could also see a selective advantage in this, uh, the offspring to the migrants. So here's the proportion of survivals in uh, native offspring and in immigrant first generation offspring. So the immigrant offspring had almost twice as high uh, survival rate than the native ones. And they also had higher um, breeding success compared to native offspring um, and at the same time we could also see that the population has been uh, increasing in numbers so uh, it seems like uh, this uh, immigration event uh, actually resulted in genetic rescue at least in the first generation offspring but then for the next study we wanted to know uh, for how long does this uh, rescue effect actually last so most studies on genetic rescue actually stop after the first uh, generation. Um, but we wanted to look into like, the second and third generation offspring as well. Um, so then we extended the pedigree um, up until 2019. So we could include the second and third generation offspring as well. And we can see that once again, their survival is uh, just as low as uh, native offspring. Um, and we could also see that uh, there was uh, quite a few uh, um, inbreeding events between these uh, immigrant uh, lineages. And we can also see a gradual change in uh, genetic uh, composition that's happened after the immigration, that this uh, blue cluster is uh, increasing. So uh, based on this study, it seems like this uh, initial, initial genetic rescue only lasted for one uh, single generation. And then we um, did whole genome sequencing of uh, um, a subset of individuals born uh, before and after the immigration. Uh, and then we could identify long homozygous stretches in the genome. And these are known as uh, runs of homozygosity and they are a signature of uh, inbreeding. 
so each line here is an individual and the filled blocks is a run of homozygosity. Um, the black ones are natives. You can see that some have runs of homozygosity stretching over entire chromosomes uh, or scaffolds. You can see them here. And in the F1 generation, they have very few runs of homozygosity. But then in the F2 and F3 generation, in some individuals, they are becoming abundant again. So um, some of them are highly inbred. Okay, so to conclude this uh, first part a bit, um, we could see that this uh, initial genetic rescue effect was in fact very short-lived um, and that uh, a single pulse of immigration is far from enough um, for population viability. So uh, the, there's a high importance of regular gene flow. So. Uh, this opened up for some new directions, and now we wanted to look more into the genetic mechanisms of inbreeding depression uh, by looking into coding regions of the genome. So uh, for that, we identified, we looked into functional parts of the genome, and we identified mutations um, based on three different categories. So uh, uh, low impact mutations, these are synonymous mutations, uh, moderately deleterious mutations, uh, such as missense mutations, so they are um, expected to slightly alter protein effectiveness, uh, and also high impact mutations. So these are, for example, loss of function mutations that are causing the protein not to be expressed. Um, yeah, so when we did this, we could see that uh, when we look at the uh, loss of function mutations, so those that are uh, expected to be the most harmful, uh, we can see that uh, immigrant uh, descendants actually have uh, a higher proportion of uh, loss of function mutations compared to native individuals. Um, but we don't see this uh, at uh, missense mutations. So uh, it seems like the immigrant descendants have uh, brought in some uh, um, additional harmful mutations that were previously absent uh, from the population. And they could have been absent due to purging, previous purging, um, so natural selection against these uh, harmful mutations, or they were just not present before. Um, and then, um, when uh, we link this to uh, different fitness traits, we could also see that uh, individuals with a higher proportion of these strongly harmful mutations, so loss of function mutations, they uh, produce uh, uh, small, um, a smaller number of offspring throughout their lives. So they have a lower lifetime reproductive success. They also live shorter lives and they have smaller average uh, litter size. But uh, again, we didn't see um, this pattern or there was no significant effect when we looked at missense mutations or synonymous mutations. Um, so in this subpopulation, it seems like uh, strongly harmful mutations are um, a major driver of inbreeding depression and that uh, immigrants actually brought in some uh, um, new harmful mutations that were not present before and perhaps this could uh, um, contribute to the, to the very short-lived uh, um, genetic rescue effect and also combined with these rodent cycles the study system becomes uh, very vulnerable um, so that could also enhance that the, the effect is so short-lived. Um, and then for, for the final study of my thesis, um, I wanted to find out more about this. So this was quite uh, an intriguing pattern. But uh, I wanted to know more. So is, is this uh, effect very sp specific to this southern subpopulation that I've studied? Or can it be a more general effect? Can I also find it in another subpopulation? And also, we didn't know anything about the genomic variation in the actual migrants. So um, 
So for the next study, I sequenced individuals from this um, northern subpopulation called Vindelfjellen, and it's of similar size as uh, the more southern one, and it also experienced uh, immigration from this captive breeding station. And um, we also sequenced the genome of the immigrants. So, um, we can see that in both of the subpopulations, the heterozygosity is uh, increasing after immigration. This is in Helags, and this is in Winderfjellen. And the uh, inbreeding levels are decreasing after immigration in both subpopulations. Um, but when we look at these uh, strongly harmful mutations that I talked about before, the loss of function mutations. Uh, it's only in uh, Helagsfjellen that uh, the mutations are increasing after immigration. So we don't see the same effect in Vindelfjellen. So it seems to be a specific, effect, uh, a specific pattern in Helags. And I think that this could potentially be due to that Helagsfjellen is more uh, southern located and it's uh, more isolated than the populations further north. So uh, uh, probably the population in Winterfjellen has already um, had gene flow from other populations as well, not only from this uh, breeding station. Yeah, and uh, when we look at uh, PCA, this is of the southern population that I studied the most. We can see that native individuals, they form a very tight uh, cluster. And then the migrants are very divergent from the native gene pool. And then the hybrids, they end up in the middle in between. But in the more northern population, the native individuals, they don't really form a cluster at all. So it seems like they are have higher genetic variation um, and the uh, migrants are not as divergent um, from the natives. So it seems to be an isolation effect. Um, and so if we look at where these migrants come from, um, so as I said before, they come from a captive breeding program and they uh, take foxes from all the different uh, subpopulations and then they uh, breed them together. Um, and here you can see, here are the different migrants and here are the one individual each from the subpopulation that they originate from. And you can see for the strongly harmful mutations, they actually have a, a higher level of harmful mutations compared to the individuals uh, or to the individuals from this different uh, subpopulation that they come from. So, uh, um, so maybe when you breed them together, they, uh, because these are all fragmented in Sweden and Norway, and due to genetic drift, they could have accumulated um, different uh, particular harmful mutations. And then when you uh, mix them together in the breeding program, uh, they could accumulate quite high mutational load. Uh, and in this smaller, po um, more isolated population in Helagsfjellen, it could be that these uh, new mutations quite quickly start becoming expressed. Um, and yeah, this is from uh, another recent study, not made by me, but uh, from a simulation shown that uh, um, when uh, that it uh, can be important to take into account the uh, migrant population size. So when a small and inbred population is rescued um, by a large uh, population with high genetic variation, it can actually be faced with increased uh, extinction risk um, due to the quite high amount of deleterious variation harbored in heterozygote state. Uh, but if it's uh, rescued by a small or medium-sized population, um, it, could, uh, um, 
yeah, it could lead to more long-term population viability due to the lower amount of uh, harmful mutations due to um, previous purging. So uh, the migrant population size can be important to take into account. Um, and this is another simulation shown that the uh, recipient population size is also important to take into account. So that there are some quite extreme scenarios when the population size becomes so small that uh, it's not possible to purge the deleterious variation brought in by migrants. So instead of genetic rescue, uh, it faces increased uh, extinction risks instead. Okay, so uh, to conclude this talk, um, in my thesis, I uh, think that I demonstrated that um, genetic rescue uh, can often be, or in this case, was very short-lived. Um, and that uh, immigrants seem to have brought in a number of harmful mutations and that these mutations influence fitness, which could have contributed to this uh, short-lived effect. Uh, and that the outcome of immigration can be highly context specific and so it's important to take in into account both the demography of both the, the recipient and the uh, migrant population. Okay, that's it. So with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, the rest of the Arctic Fox family and uh, all the co-authors and uh, all the volunteers and rangers that uh, helped out with the field work over the years, uh, and also all the different funders. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, I thought that I would uh, just finish off by sh uh, showing a short video. It's only four minutes and uh, it's, um, it's a video of the field work that we do in the summer, so you can get a little picture of how it can look. Let's see if it works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so sorry, this is in Swedish. <laughs> this is the um, uh, professor in our group, and um, he's saying that uh, you don't need to bring any chocolate or nuts into the field, you can just eat uh, these really tasty plants that you can find. <laughs> and then he's filmed them secretly taking out like a big bag of peanuts. <laughs>
That was an old field worker that made this movie, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mali. Thanks for this video. It was, wow, awesome. What a landscape. And so, questions? Hi. Thank you for the talk and the very nice uh, video and pictures. <laughs> so, I was wondering, in the debate, between maximizing genetic diversity and minimizing mm -hmm. genetic load? Yeah. Like, do you think that it would be, like, it seems like the captive program is trying to maximize genetic diversity mm -hmm. by mixing all the different subpopulations of Norwegian uh, foxes? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have, like, any... And so what you find is, like, the, the genetic rescue lasts for a short time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea if there is any like natural migrations from one of the uh, Norwegian populations with like a pure Norwegian individual, which would have not the genetic load of, of the captive breeding program, but maybe you can see uh, a different effect on genetic rescue or the same, and, mm -hmm. and that would, I don't know if you have any data on that yeah. or, or they're doing any. Yeah, that. Uh I was thinking of that when I was doing the, the final chapter of my thesis that uh, this would be a super interesting next step to see what is, is, there, a, is there a difference when there's a, a pure individual coming in. Um, I don't know if, we, I know there has been some natural immigration at least into the other subpopulations, but uh, um, into this southern one it has been very, very isolated. So. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think it would be hard to get that kind of data, maybe for, but it would be cool to do like a, a review or a, a meta-analysis of uh, many different study, study systems and compare. Uh, but also I think that it's, it's in this quite extreme scenario in this very isolated subpopulation and there's a single pulse of gene flow of individuals from, with very high genetic variation from this captive breeding station that we see this effect. So uh, uh, I don't mean that the captive breeding station is it's generally like a bad approach, but uh, perhaps for this specific subpopulation, it would have been better to, to have migration from a nearby subpopulation instead. Uh, but more importantly, to just um, get like regular gene flow going on and not just a single pulse into a small population. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, it was really great, and the video as well. So when you are looking at the runs of hemozygosity mm -hmm. and how they have changed mm -hmm. uh, when they have the, the increase between F1 and F2 and F3 is like quite high, like mm -hmm. the runs of hemozygosity increase a lot again. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, because you have pedigrees and everything, if there is any kind of assortative mating mm -hmm. 
uh, after they have like the first impulse of like, like the first entrance of the immigrants, if then suddenly individuals start to reproduce again between the ones that were like the uh, descendants from the first ones and not with the hybrids, do you know what I mean? Like the assortative mating between the specific hybrids or not, or well hybrids, mm. you know what I mean, yeah. like F1 yeah. or of the So, so we can see that the, the, um, the risk, um, the inbreeding is returning quite quick, so there's both uh, um, back crosses within yeah. native lineages that becoming inbred again, but we could also see, I think we saw like 12 uh, the different examples of uh, inbreeding within the immigrant lineages. And we do see that there is uh, some degree of inbreeding avoidance. Um, so they seem to, that they can discriminate individuals that they have been, uh, they're born in the same litter, mm -hmm. but they can't discriminate a full sibling that was born a year before or a year after. So there's some degree of inbreeding avoidance, but it's not that strong, so, so yeah. So, um, thanks, very interesting. I'm really interested about this captive program mm -hmm. issue. So, so, from what you said, the proportion of harmful uh, mutations is increased by the, the way that they used individuals from different subpopulations, right? Um, I mean, so with hindsight, <coughs> would you say that could have been a, uh, avoided um, and that the captive management should have been different? Um, and, and do you know any other cases where that's been shown? Any other species where, where they've had you find in the literature similar consequences of mixing different subpopulations and captivity? Mm, no, I haven't really found. Uh, I think this it's uh, quite new that uh, we can start studying these uh, processes. And I don't know if they could have done anything differently. Like if, if I was setting up a captive breeding station, I, was pro I would probably do the same to just uh, take individuals from different subpopulations. Um, I think in the future, um, you could probably take this into account and that you can see what, uh, but then you need to sequence a lot of individuals and see, get a repre representative picture of the uh, recipient population and see, okay, what harmful mutations is actually here and what in the captive breeding station and maybe you could choose individuals that are not bringing in lots of new variation um, but I don't know like the the situation is more or less going back to what it was before the immigration um, we don't see that it's really deteriorating quickly that the fitness is, is getting even lower than it was before and the immigrants are not like completely taking over so I wouldn't say that the effect was it, it, it was worse than before. So uh, probably, like it, the population ex still experienced a boost when the immigrants came in, but yeah. So I think the, the most important is to just uh, establish a more regular gene flow and have individuals coming in regularly. But uh, yeah. Thank you. yeah. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. So inbreeding depression is a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, it it uh, links genetics and, and demography, and that's a, that's a very cool thing. So in relation to the two last uh, questions, to what extent you're having outbreeding depression in this, uh, in this system? Because it's quite uh, shocking. Well, it's normal, you know, the, the to detect a uh, hybrid uh, vigor in the F1, mm -hmm. and then everything drops yeah. in the subsequent uh, yeah. generations. So uh, inbred populations, in, they find a way, you know, to make it with a poor performance, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, to what extent here you might have outbreeding depression just because gene flow is punctual and not regular, as, mm -hmm. you, as you said? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think that we have outbreeding depression because in that case the, the fitness would be even lower than before, right? Yeah, and we don't really see that. So I think it's just more an effect of very short-lived rescue. So it's more a heterosis effect. So like you say, a selective advantage in F1s and then the effect just disappears. Um, but no, I, I don't think that we have outbreeding depression here. Yeah. Another short question. Uh, my understanding is that uh, you collected data from live individuals. Yeah. 
don't you have data, genetic data from, from dead foxes? Uh, some, but we, um, we very rarely find them uh, when they're dead. Yeah, it's hard. So um, the, the biggest uh, mortality, like uh, reasons, is uh, predation and starvation, we think. But uh, yeah, we very rarely find them dead. Sometimes we find a dead cub on a, uh, at a den, but uh, yeah, so yeah. So thanks, Malin, for, for a great talk and great video. And, uh, and it's amazing how it's great that you're here <laughs> now in our group because it is the same kind of issues we are trying to address with the Iberian lynx and, and a similar scenario as well with the rescue that has been driven mostly by few individuals, one or single or a few individuals. And so the same kind of processes might be occurring in, in, in the Iberian lynx. So in terms of a more general discussion, um, I wonder if it, you find it possible to 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 tear apart the the reduction in fitness in F2 and F3, that one due to uh, inbreeding from of local of immigrant alleles, rather than you know dilution of um, uh, heterozygosity, a more global general effect. So, so so if the if you can tell apart reduction in fitness in F2 F3 due to uh, what so, so which part of this reduction is just due to the inbreeding of immigrant mm -hmm. alleles? If you, if, if, if you could, the, the question I guess more broadly is, uh, seems like the problem of introducing genetic load, mm -hmm. new novel genetic load, mm -hmm. is that it become expressed. And, and mm -hmm. that will only happen if you have inbreeding, right? Mm -hmm. or, or will likely mm -hmm. happen only if you have inbreeding. So if you could avoid inbreeding, then maybe F2, F3 generations will still show some higher fitness, mm -hmm. right? So some fitness advantage. So do you think it's feasible with your data or with the data we are collecting now for the Iberian links is to, to tease apart these two effects? I mean. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess you would have to follow like the Dif all the different ancestry and right, the right. strains. Yeah, right I guess it's more yeah. Yeah, trying to separate yeah. inbred F2 from yeah. non inbred F2 or F3. Uh, yeah. I guess that would be possible when you have uh, both the pedigree and genomic data. But yeah, I need to think about it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and w do you think what are the chances of? assigning high effect loss, identifying those loss that contributing to reduced fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we did try to, uh, to look at specific uh, mutations that could potentially affect fitness uh, to reduce litter size or lifespan. Uh, but in our case, we didn't find uh, like any like, uh, different, there were many different biologi biological processes involved, but we didn't find anything significant. And I mean, this is expected because uh, these traits are probably, there are many loci involved in, in litter size. Uh, so uh, I think that is very tricky to, to find the genetic basis between fitness traits like that. But yeah, maybe for the epilepsy that you have in the Iberian lynx, it's, yeah. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I, d I am. I'm just wondering, you know, long term, from the conservation management point of view, the long term future, as far as I understand it, it seems very bleak in terms <laughs> of the temperature increase. Yes. I mean, we just learned today that for the first time for the last 12 months, every day we've been 1.5 degrees or higher mm. over the long term average mm. in the global mm. average temperature. <coughs> Temperatures increasing a lot faster uh, up, uh, up, up your latitudes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. how could this species in that area in the long term be maintained? Uh, probably not. I think the, <laughs> the future for the Arctic fox in Scandinavia is uh, very, very dark. So, uh, and that would depend on the, like, what happens with the global warming in the, in the future. So, but at least I think we should do what we can to try to 
uh, conserve it for now, but uh, yeah, I think it's a dark future, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I have a question myself. Um, do you know any like the reason about like this uh, diminution of the rodents in the mm. Arctic? No, or that's like, like yeah, a big mystery. So, and also like the rodent cycles in general, why they peak like this and uh, and crash after it's uh, not that well studied. So it's yeah, it's a mystery. <laughs> okay, so there is still things to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's all for the seminar. There is no questions in YouTube. So thanks again all for coming and thanks Mali for your Thank presentation. You. Thank you.